Welcome to Perry World House. Today, I couldn't be more pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Olafemi Taiwo, who will discuss his most recent book, Reconsidering Reparations. Some of you, I see, have it with you there. Uh, it's a profound work that reflects on the violent colonial history of our global economic order and asks how justice can be achieved against this backdrop. The book offers what Femi calls a world-making view of reparations and discusses appropriate responses to past injustice and looks to the future about how we might think about the adverse impacts of climate change. He argues that reparations can be both a tool for compensation for historical exploitation and a way to increase the autonomy and resilience of formerly colonized countries. Uh, Femi's work is, of course, incredibly timely as the global conversation on reparations continues to advance and as the climate crisis grows more severe and as these two issues become connected in the discussion around loss and damage. He also comes to us during Black History Month, which offers us a special moment to reflect on the triumphs and struggles of those of African ancestry here in the United States and to ask how we can do better. Perhaps we can take some of our cues from Dr. Taiwo's work. So on that note, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our distinguished guest. Uh, Femi Taiwo is an assistant professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. His theoretical work draws liberally from the black radical tradition, contemporary philosophy of language, contemporary social science, German transcendental philosophy, materialist thought, histories of activism, and activist thinkers. He, and all of this is in the book as well. So it's a really wonderful um, combination of so many different sources. He writes public philosophy, including articles that explore intersections of climate justice and colonialism. Femi completed his PhD at UCLA and also holds a BA in philosophy and in political science from Indiana University. Femi, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. And we look forward to hearing a little bit about your wonderful book. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to Michael and Perry World House for getting this all together and giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the book and the thoughts that are in the book. Um, so maybe just to get everything out on the table so that we can talk about it together, I'll say, um, Few of the main things that happened in the book and that the book is designed to try to identify. So the very first substantive chapter of the book after the introduction is something that goes through history and the various um, innovations and challenges that have been made to what I think has been largely revisionist histories or things um, that have Included the role of slavery and colonialism in the British world, what it is today. And I think to put even a finer point on it, making the world today. We didn't always have a world. There were regional systems of trade and political intrigue that were often quite large, maybe quite robust or small. But having a planet sized Political and economic system was actually something that was quite new. It was accomplished in the 16th century, and it was accomplished by way of the very things that um, I'm talking about under the heading of reparations, reparations for transatlantic What I'm trying to impress upon the readers, what I'm trying to impress upon you all, is that when we're talking about transatlantic slavery and colonialism, we're not just talking about atrocities that happened in the past, though that's obviously very important and in and of itself a good reason to have a conversation about morality and justice and connection to those past atrocities. But one of the things that makes transatlantic slavery and colonialism and the matrix of things that I call global racial equities, what makes those events so important or particularly important is that they are also the events of the construction of the world, of a planet-sized global system. Our world order exists because of transatlantic slavery and colonialism. So on the basis of that understanding, I think the form of reparations that makes sense in response to injustices that have that kind of causal impulse, that have that kind of consequence, is a reparations campaign of a similar size and scope. The goal to restructure our world of and that is what I call the constructive view of reparations. 
So we're gonna just check your your mic. Um, yeah, it's on. Um, so, yeah, well, you can definitely hear me now. <laughs> All right. So global racial empire, bad, 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 happened in the past, reason why we have this plant size world order. The version of reparations that makes sense to me in response to that would be a reparations campaign of a similar scope. And I may get my business book to say, what that is, why, and why it's different from other ways of thinking about reparations that uh, may be more familiar. And perhaps in the Q&A, we'll get into that. Um, but I wanna just end by saying the second major thing that the book attempts to do on the basis of that understanding of the past and of the present task of reparation. You know, um, a lot of times people talk about historical or, um, conceptual links between the past history of racial injustice and our present climate crisis. Those are very good things to talk about. There's plenty of links of that kind. But actually, the link that makes most sense to me that I would give the most priority to is actually just a practical link between reparations and the task of racial justice and addressing the climate crisis in a way that's compatible, consonant with the task of racial justice. And that is simply this. What happens to the planet and the social system that we built upon the planet is going to be decisive for the project of reaching racial justice in exactly the same way that the ground beneath us right now is what makes this building stand up. It is the practical circumstances under which we can succeed or fail to achieve racial justice. If the world is three or four degrees hotter, if the sea levels are rising, if food and energy systems are disrupted, those are going to put pressures on our political and social systems. And the people that are currently thrown under the bus when our social and economic systems are imperiled are disproportionately black, brown, and indigenous people. And that's not a coincidence. It is based on how this present system was constructed, that those are the people that are treated as expendable, that those are the people that are rendered most vulnerable in advance of the climate crisis. So if we want a just future, we have to respond to our past with reparatory justice, but we have to respond to our past in a way that challenges and that gets out in front of the potential injustices that are coming down the road, potential ways that our world might respond to yesterday's injustice in a way that creates tomorrow's injustice. We need to prevent those things. So I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to hearing what Michael and everyone else has to say. Thanks, thanks so much, Femi. Um, I uh, have many pages of notes here, so I will, um, a little high, Peter, if you can bring it down just a bit. So. Um, my first question is, can you talk a little bit about, you, you say part of the book is to defend a, a novel view of reparations, a constructive view. So maybe you could tell us what a, what can, what a constructive view is and, and kind of your version of it. Yeah, so um, I, I wouldn't say the constructive view is novel. In fact, I would say the constructive view in previous eras, eras of politics was actually the most popular way of thinking about global justice. For example, in the decades of anti-colonial activism after the Second World War, um, the consensus there among people fighting for national independence throughout Asia and Africa was that the whole planet was going to have to change. There was um, a push for a new international economic order, a push for um, more egalitarian functioning in multinational institutions like the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund. And that perspective, the idea that we're going to build on a planetary scale, new ways of relating to each other economically and politically, that's the constructive view. The idea that how we should respond to the past is by redistributing the wealth and social advantages that are now baked into 
how the world works now and rebuilding that in a way that is compatible with justice and equity. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, you know, in, in, in part of uh, your, your discussing some of this, uh, at one point in the book you say, um, and, I, and I've lost the page where you say this, um, that you wanna decouple um, liability from compensation. And I wonder if you could talk a little more about that. Maybe the decouple is not your term, but you said that they're usually treated as as connected, and, and you think it's important to understand um, how they're not. Yeah, I think that's right. So the basic thing that I would say is that liability and responsibility are a different concept. Um, those of you in the room who might have a law background might heard of the term strict liability, but sometimes you can just have to pay the cost of something. And it's not necessarily because of what you did or even necessarily because of um, some guilt or blame that you should carry. It's just what your role is in making the world work differently. The reason why I'm talking about this is because a lot of our notions of moral responsibility are built for much smaller kinds of interactions than 500 years of human economic and social history, right? Um, we blame people for situations like when I break a promise to my friend or my sibling. Right? These are, that's the scale of human relationships that our intuitive notions of moral responsibility are really built to handle. And it's difficult to make them work at the scale that I think we need to to understand the world as we found it, right? Hundreds of years of political and economic development. I think it's better and more straightforward to just say whoever was responsible, however we think of moral responsibility and sense of blameworthiness, all the wealth has ended up in the global north, um, communities and households of the racially advantaged, um, in the global north and the global south. And that's not a state of affairs that is just. That's a state of affairs that represents the imprint today of apartheid yesterday. And we need to change those distributions and we need to change the system that explains those distributions if we want justice and equity. Yeah, so just sort of building on that, I know I've taken slightly out of order in your book, but you say, um, that the project of reparations is to learn how to distribute capabilities justly in order to make a new world. Such a just world must, by its nature, be fundamentally incompatible for the one we're in now, the world of global racial empire in which laws and norms maintain the unjust distribution of racial capitalism. I, I think that really sums up the core of the first half of the book. So I wanted to ask you then about some of the mechanisms that you think bring about that redistribution of capabilities. So. I mean, you have, you have a list of them, but I wondered if you wanted to talk about some of your favorite ones. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always good to start this discussion with cash. I mean, who doesn't? Give, right? <laughs> give people money, straight up. And it's not, it's not really that complicated, right? Like having, how much money you have, whether or not you get a check in the mail determines in a really direct way that we all understand and engage with every day what you can do, right? Whether you can buy things, what kind of savings um, you're able to engage in, all those sorts of things. So giving people you know, the unconditional cash transfer, if we want to use wonkier language about it, that's a gold standard of reparations discussions for a reason. It's a great tool and we should start there. Um, but I think we also need to change the system that explains why some people have more money than other people in general, right, um, in the first place. And that's the same system that explains um, why black and brown people breathe more polluted air than white people do. Right? That's also the system that explains why black and brown communities live closer to sites of toxic waste. It's also the system that explains where research universities like this one are located and who has access to those and what they produce. And we're not one check away from changing those distributions. So we should start with 
giving people sex, but maybe not end them. Um, so additional forms of redistribution beyond sex would include um, global climate funding. One of the things I talk about in the book is the Green Climate Fund, which is a, it's a fund that already exists that's supposed to finance green development um, in the global south. Um, it, all the details matter, whether funding comes in terms of loans, which creates debt or cash grants, but those are other good ideas. Um, changing how multinational institutions are governed. Um, right now, the governance of international institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank is heavily skewed towards Global North. Changing that in a way that gave Global South countries more power would also be good. I could go on, but money and power, reshuffle. All right. Um, so you, you brought up uh, climate, so I wanna, I wanna ask you uh, maybe two more questions before we open the floor. Um, uh, so you, know, you've, you, have, you mentioned the Green Climate Fund and these other uh, mechanisms ensuring that, that um, the Global South has more power in, in distribution and that it doesn't create more debt, doesn't reproduce some of the same patterns. What are what are some of the other like really you know, big issues of climate justice that that we should or I should say what are what are ways of addressing climate injustice that that we should be thinking more seriously about uh, taking the perspective of your book? Uh, one thing that's gotten a lot of attention but not as much attention as it deserves is uh, loss and damage. So how is it that the international system responds after climate related disasters happen? Um, I think there's not nearly enough funding for loss and damage. Lots zero of is, is a very low number. Zero, yeah. <laughs> zero is a very low number. Um, you know, and that's something that global north countries, especially high emitting countries, um, should take the lead on. There's the so called adaptation gap, which I think is credible estimates put in the trillions in terms of how expensive it would be to change our physical infrastructure and our social infrastructure in ways that um, respond to the new climate realities that we're going to have to deal with, new sea level, new levels of hurricanes and cyclones. Um, credible estimates put that gap in the trillions. So again, there needs to be more funding. Um, again, I could go on, but those, those seem like good. No, that's, those are, those, and it, so I have one more question, and please now um, begin both online and in the room to think about questions. Peter, we'll need another microphone, actually, for, for, the, for the mic stand. Um, I'd love to know, I, I think I've asked you this question um, before a few months ago. Like, just, what, what do you think of as, are there any models anywhere where some of the ideas that you advocate have been, have, have been successful? Like, you know, if we, if, if we if we walk away, we walk out of the room thinking, okay, Femi's we go, he's convinced us. Like, where should we look as a kind of exemplar to fix our imagination around uh, the kinds of changes that you're advocating? Actual examples, or even just like you know, strong advocates that really were able to really, um, really, really show us the vision concrete. I think that if you're willing to look at different scales, you'll find lots of examples. Um, here's a couple. Um, in the late 80s, the Brazilian Workers' Party um, pioneered a new form of government that they called participatory budgeting. Um, it started in Porto Alegre after the Brazilian dictatorship ended. And this was a way that people could, in a sort of town hall format, just decide how public resources were going to get used. And they were careful to make sure that um, people who were lower income had higher representation in these processes and so on and so forth. That's something that's been adopted by other cities, but at a small scale in terms of how much money these processes were given to play with. Um, one particularly good example is the state of Kerala in India, which built this into um, a number of their, which, which built this into their governance pro processes at 
all different levels um, and which had the same amount of care to um, the caste status of the people who are participating. And I think those kinds of interventions simultaneously redistribute decision-making power, politically speaking, and they also redistribute finance because what people are doing is deciding directly what they should do with public funds. And I think that kind of intervention shows where we need to go. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Okay, so we can start taking questions from the floor. So there's a microphone over there, and we also have, um, uh, uh, on Zoom, you can please use the Q&A feature, and we'll, we'll be able to see it up here. Uh, we'll have our first question from Sam. Um, hi, uh, I'm Sam. I'm a uh, senior at the Center for Jewish Studies Group. Um, and uh, I have a big question. Um, in your view, what are your, what, what are the implications of the development of climate intervention technologies like stratospheric aerosol injection, which would try to suppress global warming for climate justice in the global south? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, so there's stratospheric aerosols and um, other approaches that are broadly under the heading of what some people call geoengineering. Um, for me, I think it raises the stakes of the decision-making power redistribution end of the constructive view. Right? We want to change who has money or social resources, but we also want to change who has decision-making power over how those resources get used and allocated in the first place. And those are related but different things. Um, I think it certainly raises the political stakes. You could imagine um, Global North countries unilaterally, or perhaps just billionaires unilaterally deciding to um, embark on stratospheric aerosol injection without any kind of governance by you know, the people who stand to lose if the injection doesn't go as planned. Um, so I think it's potentially a huge problem. Um, there needs to be comprehensive planetary scale governance of both um, and public finance for both the research and the actual potential deployment of technologies like that. And unless and until we get meaningfully democratic, meaningfully um, participatory forms of governance, I'm going to be you know, thumbs down. Oh, that kind of thing. Thanks, uh, Femi. OK, I want to take one from uh, Zoom. So how is the constructive view of reparations different from other campaigns, such as that of CARICOM? Maybe you can yeah, so CARICOM, or the Caribbean Community of Nations, has a reparations commission, um, which has put forward um, one of, I think, a really exemplary approach to what reparations should accomplish. They call for um, cash transfer, but they also call for transfer of technology, they call for debt cancellation, they call for comprehensive public health measures. And so that kind of scope that we should be thinking about that fits with the constructive view. Um, so the constructive view, I don't think is different from, you know, what CARICOM is doing is an example of the constructive view. Constructive view is just a name that I'm giving to a scope of aspirations for reparations that people have been pursuing for decades. Okay, great. Um, Ken. Um, I had a question about the, you know, you had, in thinking about reparations, there's the cash part and then the systemic part. So like in thinking about the systemic part, I was just wondering about um, what do you think about ways in which changing the systemic part might change the world in such a way that attachments and values that people have and lots of, you know, brown people around the world, brown and black people and indigenous people, might have to change. You know, I'm thinking of here things like you get attached to a particular nationality or culture or living in a particular place, and actually it turns out that the best way to change the systematic features of our world so that we have more balance of power is to not have, you know, people concentrated in places with a lack of certain kinds of resources and have to literally move people to places with 
more resources. And so, yeah, I could just picture the, the changing the system being something that doesn't only negatively affect the people who are currently benefiting, but actually in some ways affects cur current people, right, who have formed attachments um, and who derive value from the current arrangement, so they could have more, right, um, for the sake of future people who might have much more justly treated in this case than if they had not been benefited. Yeah, it's a really deep question. Thanks. Um, so there are there are trade-offs between people, you know, based on where they're positioned in a broad sense, which part of which is hierarchical, but part of which is just straight up geographic, right? You know, people might need to move or cities might need to be erected or populations might need to change um, in places and it's it's hard to in a it's hard to be precise about who will be winners and who will be losers in these kinds of changes and that's part of why um, the constructive view is so um, is so unapologetically planetary Right? Because I think if you have a view of reparations that just says, no, it's just the thing that happens when these people get a check or when these people get an apology, um, then you know, I think we're, we're not live to those trade-offs and we're not taking them with the seriousness that they require. So I think that I, I should add one thing about the intergenerational aspect of this. Uh, the last chapter of the book talks about the moral perspective of being an ancestor um, and acting from a political perspective where one of the, you know, one of the things you're trying to do is set up the world after you in a way that is compatible with justice, that is compatible with um, continuing to struggle and move forward towards justice. And that might mean things not being absolutely as well for you as they otherwise might. It might involve some measure of sacrifice with respect to your children and your grandchildren, and not your children just in the biological sense, but your successors, like the people who come after you who don't have to be your biological children. So I think those trade-offs are um, worth taking on board, and the constructive view is partially built because Thanks, thanks, Jen. Um, it's interesting what your the the your back and forth with Jen and um, and the, the the a lot of the where the discussion about loss and damage is just like far too weak is like it's getting hung up on money when really what we're talking about is what's the world going to look like in two hundred years? You know, and that's in some sense a theme of your book is the idea. Right? So I think that's so. The, the, I mean, I wish we could just have a conversation on just that one point because that's a very profound discussion. Let me take another one from Zoom, and then we'll hop back over to, uh, to, the, to the room. So um, this question says, I work for a state-based health agency in Pennsylvania. Health equity is a major part of social reform as health equity in terms of more intentional access to resources based on race and ethnicity been viewed um, as a tool in the, in the reparations toolkit as you're developing it, in particular because of the endemic inherited health system. Yeah, I think it definitely um, I think health equity is is central, um, especially as it intersects with issues of um, age-based and ability-based susceptibility to climate impact. So these are things that we have to put front and center if we're trying to design ways of responding to climate crisis that are going to meet any criteria of justice worth having. Um, and that's one of the things I like in particular about um, about CARICOM's reparations plan as a uh, explicit public health component to how they think about reparations. And the movement for Black Lives does as well, um, maybe less as a part of reparations, but as a part of their broader conception of racial justice. So I think there are available views of racial justice that people are organizing about, not just theorizing about that are taking health equity to be central and important. And that's good to do so. Great, Mike. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. Um, 
this is, this is just like a really big question. It sort of ties to what Professor Morton was saying. I wanted to know, like, on your view, um, what the political form of like the nation state, um, how it fits into like a sort of future oriented like world making project. Like often when I think about global justice and climate justice, I think about like this, the nation as like holding out so much hope and also being in the way at the same time. And, and then the moments you were talking about in the seventies, you know, there are a lot of battles over this and self-determination versus federalism. And it's just the invitation to say more about how, how you see world making in terms of like the dominant forms of political organization. Yeah, I, I was not, yeah. not a hard question or anything. Should we? <laughs> uh, I thought I was going to get away with that. <laughs> Drop the mic. Um, I'm not, I am fatalistic about the nation state in the short term, but, you know, let's say radically open to possibility in the medium long term. Right now we have a state system that is um, among, among the most important forms of political organization that we have now. It's not the be all end all, um, but it's not the sort of thing we can ignore in the short term. And so a lot of a lot of reparations campaigns have directed themselves at nation states because of this. The campaign against uh, the campaigns for people who were um, descendants of or victims of German colonial genocide, or um, the United Kingdom representing you know what's left of the British Empire reparations campaigns in the United States. I think there's a reason why nation states are targeted. It's not just because they have political power and cachet, um, but because unlike the other institutions with political power, like Amazon and Microsoft, um, these are organizations that are at least on paper supposed to be responsible to people other than shareholders. Is that our horizon for what we should want to build in the world? Do we want to have nation states at all? Should we want to have nation states that have firm police and militarized borders? I think probably not, right? Um, but what is the thing that we do instead of that? Is it revolutionary intercommunalism, as Huey Newton would say? Is it you know, small? sparsely populated communes that trade with each other every now and again. I don't have the answer to that, but, um, but I know that I would like one, and I know that we can't move towards any of the alternatives if the systems that we have now remain in place. So we can give our descendants a better set of political conditions to answer those questions. Terrific. Let's take another one from the floor, please. Maybe you can, you can take it. My name is Mir. I uh, heard you on the radio recently, and really, there was a lot to think about. Um, for a project I'm working on, I was reading, I'm just going to make a couple of observations and say your thoughts about them. One was that I was reading the, fun reading the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Plan, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their latest report for the project I'm working on. And I noticed that the word human was used over 1,500 times, right? Human derived, human and human induced, et cetera, et cetera, human activities. But the, 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 the responsibility for where, how we got here is sort of equally distributed. And the responsibility or liability to save it um, is also equally distributed. So there's no mention of the disparity about how we got here and so that's sort of the scientific side, right? That's a physical sciences report. Um, the, I was just reading the New York Times this morning and it says, I'll just read you the headline, White House takes aim at environmental racism but won't mention race. Communities of color bear a disproportionate <laughs> burden from pollution research shows. But using, this is coming from a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, but using race to allocate federal help could result in legal problems. So uh, my question to you is, the first step of 
any kind of redistributive justice, just to change the conversation about how we talk about things in which your book would help a great deal. But decision makers for reparations, loss and damage, et cetera, are political actors, right? legal actors, scientists when it, come to, come, when it comes to climate change. The humanities are, the philosophy certainly is somewhere over there. How do we start bringing some of these conversations together? What are your thoughts about that as someone who has and thinks about this all the time? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, and I think the observation you made about the humanities and where we're located relative to policymakers and uh, other people in their orbit is actually a resource we should exploit. Um, and maybe that's part of how we change the conversation. You know, at the end of the day, um, I was able to write this book because I'm not running for office. And, you know, there's, there's a part of the country that's, you know, there's a significant part of the country uh, that is not, um, and the country in the world, I should say, that may not like many of the things I have to say, and that's just kind of fine. Um, my bills get paid either way. Um, and that kind of literal material independence, you know, the, the fact that my bills get paid either way can translate into a kind of um, message independence. Maybe the White House can't say environmental racism, but I'll say it all day. Um, and, you know, if, movements coalesce around this message, then it won't, then eventually politics may progress to a place where the White House has to say it, not because they internally decided to say it, but because the people outside with the placards and signs and Molotov cocktails would really like them. Um, so I think that's how this might work. Great. A uh, lot to discuss there, too. I'm going to take one more, Theo, before your question. Um, it's actually about, um, it's connected. It's actually about institutions. So, um, you know, if you could either reform or, or invent an institution, um, I guess a global institution, that really took some of this project seriously, you know, what, what do you imagine it looks like? That's the question. Uh, if I could reform any Well, global. either create or, re like, could you reform the UN or create a new body? That had that both distributed um, uh, capabilities, but also, you know, I mean, the, the, sometimes the money part's the easy part. Someone could just decide to do that. Like, you know, is there an institution that exists? Could there be an institution that would really oversee this project? It's a terrifically easy question, I know. <laughs> it, it's a it's a great question. Um, If you got a few of the, if you got popular control of a few of the most central economic institutions, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, some of the development banks, I think it would, it wouldn't quite be a wrap for this era of racial capitalism, but it would be pretty close. I think it's, I think it's very difficult to sustain the kind of political centrality that the global north has built for itself and that white populations have built for themselves and the absence of that kind of planetary level control of where economic power comes from, um, who gets economic resources. I think you could bootstrap your way from there to something else. Now, would that something else be better or worse? That depends on you know, what decisions get made with this new level of power. It's not a magic, you know, money isn't a magic wand. It's just a resource by which you get other resources. But it would be that kind of move that I think would have transformative. Terrific. Okay, Theo. Hi there. Uh, I'm Theo Molinopoulos. I'm a, a postdoc here at Perry World House. Um, my question is about whether uh, and under what conditions you might see tension between the objectives of reparative justice 
and addressing climate change. And I guess I'm thinking specifically about situations in which uh, uh, economies in the global south may want to have the same freedoms to develop just in the way that those in the global north had done uh, in terms of polluting and, and industrializing in just the way that they saw fit and created uh, the current crisis? Yeah, that's a really important question. Um, I think there are definitely tensions, um, and I, but I think part of the reason why there are tensions is because the because social control and um, ownership of social resources is so generally unequal, right? If it were just that the global north had more money than everyone else and they didn't have you know, forms of political hegemony over what ideas circulate and what gets researched and what kinds of institutions are recognized, um, then this would be a lot less thorny of a problem. But because there is that level of hegemony, you know, the global north, you know, US, Western Europe models of what it is to develop at all are the dominant um, and other ones have been kicked to the curb. So part of what would need to get done to um, address potential areas of tension between the kinds of reparatory justice that people might want following the old ec ecologically destructive model and forms of reparatory justice that will be compatible with climate justice has to also be um, in terms of what models we develop. What, what is it really to live a decent life? How much energy do you actually need? Well, a lot if, you know, if our model of distributive justice is that everybody gets a Hummer and an apple pie, right? Um, less if everybody gets decent, accessible public transportation, forms of housing that put people close to food sources and to forms of social support, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the people pushing degrowth and other perspectives like that have done a lot of work to get those conversations off the ground. And I think those are things, those are conversations we should learn from. Take another one from Clark. Can you put the mic? Oh, closer. yeah, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask uh, sort of this is, I think that this is a very clear like synthesis of two separate but not, not uh, very clearly non distinct problems, right? Um, but also, both, both the, the campaigning for climate justice and, and anything in particular, along with the campaign for reparations face a certain amount of cynicism from even its adherents, right? And I'm wondering if, 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 if you present this as a combined approach, right, do you think that there are any sort of um, like good strategies that are incompatible with negating the sort of cynicism or humorism that people have about the position of that? Yeah. I, I remember when I was finishing this book and I was like, I've taken racial justice and climate justice, two of the most controversial topics, and found a way to make them about each other. It's a, it's a worst of both worlds kind of connection, <laughs> and everyone's going to be mad. Um, yeah, I don't the typical strategy they recommend for training, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I should have um, thought of that. Oh, I should have thought of that. But um, I don't have. It's a really, it's a really good question um, because it, it cuts to the heart of what we're actually supposed to do with any of these theories of thoughts, right? We have to convert them into action somehow, some way. And if for emotional or cultural reasons, the way we're framing it cuts in the way of that, then that's a problem. I guess I would hope that my response to the doomerism um, that a good response to the doomerism 
is to just re-emphasize the practical connection between them, right? Um, because if you emphasize the practical connection between them, then you're speaking to people in the language of action. But at the end of the day, you either want to accomplish the things that you're striving for or you don't. Um, I'm not claiming there's some moral obligation from the land of theories that you connect these issues. I'm claiming that if you want to get this thing done, this is a part of, this other thing is part of getting that done. And so I'm less trying to get people to take on an additional burden so much as I'm trying to get people to realize what the burden they've already taken on actually commits them to. And I think from that framework, people are more, so far, people have been more amenable to linking the issues if you link them that way. Um, but, you know, who knows? Time will tell. So we have a question from one of your fellow fellows, it's very well known, uh, a, who uh, worked, a UN official, um, works in climate change, wants to know, um, what would you like to see in place? If you could talk to the, those really making decisions uh, about climate change, what would you like to see in place by 2030 to really begin really paving the way for addressing that first climate change crisis? I guess that brings it a little more to the, to the concrete, but it's a great question. I mean, ideally, them not making decisions anymore. <laughs> All right, Coco, you listen. You know, we, we've had a million IPCC reports. People have met in a bunch of cities. We've had conferences. We've had agreements. And parts per million just keeps rising. I think we give somebody else a turn at the joystick see what happens. Um, you know, failing that, I'd love to get actual commitments of cash and institutional cachet in the direction of, you know, serious adaptation efforts and mitigation efforts, rolling out renewables, um, particularly in the global south on an industrial scale. Um, I'd love to see plans for that rather than plans for plans. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the more money, the more decision-making power is in the hands of things like citizens' assemblies or participatory budgeting or forms of direct democratic control over um, how these decisions get made and enforced, the better. Just a thought. I mean, one one interesting aspect of your book, even though it's radical in many ways, um, one of the things that perhaps might make things easier for some of those that resist are are actually, and this is why I was asking about it, the kind of delinking, kind of specific responsibility laid on particular countries, particular people, from collective responsibility, because there's much more appetite globally, even in the global north, for kind of we can do this together as long as we're not. We don't want to be open to you know taking that support system, but that doesn't mean we can't contribute. So I, I wonder almost like as a kind of concrete aspirational milestone, can can we actually use you know what is in many ways a very radical perspective, but actually in, in kind of the most pragmatic you know uh, street fighting kind of nitty gritty way that would be worth really exploring. I think Amanda, I know you're waiting patiently for that question. Hi. Um. Please be really close to the microphone. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, hi, thank you for coming to talk to us. Uh, earlier you mentioned uh, something along the lines of not letting t yesterday's injustices turn into tomorrow's injustices. I was just wondering in terms of today and today's injustices, what is your target audience with this book or these ideas or what are your goals for right now? Um, are you trying to reach students like us or people in academia? Um, to influence the way these issues are taught about. Um, in looking towards the future, are you trying to reach the government officials or international uh, institutions uh, like the UN? Um, are you trying to reach people that, like us, hopefully, that believe in um, uh, looking at these issues from these different perspectives um, and giving us more resources to look at them with these different perspectives or better um, and enhanced perspectives? Or are you trying to reach people who you know, don't don't believe in climate change or any of um, these related racial issues. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm emphatically preaching to the choir <laughs> in this book. Um, 
you know, maybe Mitch McConnell needs religion too, but I'm not his pastor. <laughs> um, I, you, broadly, I would say anybody who's on team racial justice, um, who is already convinced that some form of racial justice needs to happen, who's already prepared, you know, to act for that, those are the people who I imagine talking to. Um, I think as a kind of secondary version on the same thing, anybody who's convinced that climate justice and not just a kind of technocratic approach to climate change, um, that climate justice needs to happen, I'm talking to them as well. But um, I'm, I wrote the book to talk to people who already are framing these issues of our day in terms of justice, um, rather than just parts per million, or you know, rather than um, opposing the project of racial justice or climate justice, that this is a good way of doing it. And so the kinds of, you know, definitely the kinds of activists, um, a group of students today just, uh, I think today it went public, but they're suing universities to uh, get them to, as, as part of a divestment struggle, to get them to stop investing in fossil fuels and potentially invest in better things. I think those are the kinds of people who are in the target audience, the kinds of people who show up to protest against police violence. And the hope is that by, you know, maybe this will convince policymaker type people, maybe it won't, but I think convincing people who will block traffic stop pipeline and protect water and strike you know, to do those things. Struggle is how social structures change. It's not persuasion, it's not the marketplace of ideas. Um, it's political struggle. Thank you. We have time for one more question and Shay, you seem like a perfect choice. Hi, Femi. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I'm Shay. I'm a postdoc here at Prayer World House. And my question has to do with how you are thinking about the capitalist mode of production, which um, by capitalist mode of production, I mean how commodities and commodified services are produced and distributed in a capitalist or even capitalist adjacent economy. And you know, a lot of folks who are more radical have written about redistributive economics and some of those critiques that I have and that others have are, you know, that le leaves the capitalist mode of production often intact where workers are exploited and alienated. And how are you grappling with that question of, you know, the nuts and bolts of, of mode of production? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um... So let me answer this by talking about corporations. Um, and I hopefully will um, get to your question. So the capitalist mode of production is you make stuff, you sell it for more than it took to make it when you did it. Right? That's capital. When do you stop? You don't. The planet stops you. Um, and that seems bad. That doesn't seem super sustainable. <laughs> Might run out of stuff, right? Um, that's not to talk about pollution or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so fine. Uh, we could get off the boat with capitalism. And corporations are the entities that tend to take charge of this making and selling of stuff. But another way to think about corporations without leaving that behind is also as a command structure, right? They've got their managers, their executives, and they've got their shareholders. And some weird combination of these, depending on your era, decides what the corporation does, whether they keep drilling for gas or whether they stop, whether they drill over here, whether they drill over there, et cetera, et cetera. But it's 
a command structure over what that corporation does, but also a command structure over literal parts of the earth. Whether or not there will be a pipeline here depends on these shareholders and these executives. Um, whether or not energy production will go up and down depends on what a bunch of these organizations are doing. That's a command structure, and it's a command structure built around profit, shareholder value, the usual suspects. I think part of what we should be up to is rethinking that command structure. And part of reconstructing the world would be rebuilding that. How should we decide where, how energy gets produced, whether that energy is renewable or not? Um, who gets denied energy, or whether energy gets denied when there are downturns? Right now, it's investors in a lot of the world who want returns to their portfolio and make decisions accordingly. Um, but it doesn't have to be. It could be people who are trying to decide not whether the S&P should be this number or that number, but who would be deciding what to do about energy. And so that idea of economic democracy, I think, is there as well with the constructive. That's a direction we could take reconstruction. That's the direction I would choose if it were up to me. Uh, but it's not up to me. It's up to everybody. And we'll stop there. Well, thank you so much, Kami. Um, I, I hope that you all realize in the audience, the physical and the virtual audience, um, that we're just scratching the surface of this incredibly rich book. And I really encourage you, those of you that are curious enough to uh, have a copy of it, really encourage you to explore it. I think it's uh, it's hard to do it justice. Um, just all the many sources that you was able to weave together. But you're also a really wonderful writer. So I've really read it over the weekend. It's really a great pleasure to really engage with it. I um, want to thank you, audience, both the virtual audience and the audience that's in the room today with us uh, for joining us for this discussion. I hope it gave you many things to think about. Uh, and that is, of course, the point of, of doing this, the point of uh, writing books like this. Um, and uh, I also want to hope that we could see you back at Fairy World House next week on Tuesday, 4 p.m., for the next edition of The World Today. It's titled Leading the World in Semiconductor Design Insights from Industry. Um, this event, senior advisor. I was like, wow, what a transition. <laughs> the uh, senior, ad <laughs> senior advisor to the Atlantic Council Geotech uh, Center, Melissa Flagg, senior vice president of technology and product uh, engineering at AMD, um, uh, president of product technologies. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost, I've lost my place. But also our colleague, David Houck from uh, the Wharton School. So they'll discuss the important role of semiconductor production to the global economy and the political ramifications for offshoring semiconductor ma manufacturing with offshoring. As always, you can access a recording of this conversation on our YouTube channel, and you can find out all about it and all the great events, including many more uh, in this theme and in the theme of climate and loss and damage and adaptation that we have planned for the semester and beyond. We have a really wonderful um, colloquium coming up that will touch on some of these issues specifically in small island developing states. So be uh, on the lookout for those things on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and wherever you find your news. Uh, those of you in person, please stop by the student lounge behind you for a uh, grab and glow snack. And thank you so much for all of you being here today. And most importantly, thank you, Kemi. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.